Hello, and thank you for coming to our senior design presentation. My name is Aaron Gettig. This is Daniel Horton, Alex Latsko, uh, Lorraine Santosh Matthew, Dennis Swave, and Jonathan Wong, and we are the Moon Dust Mitigators. Our presentation will feature a brief introduction on the problem of unmitigated PSI, group service interaction, uh, followed up by an in-depth analysis of our design. Notably, this will feature a simulink simulation of the dynamics of our design, followed up by a uh, component overview, a thermal and structural analysis, and thermal and structural analysis, and concluding with a mass and cost estimate. Good to, I'm just going to keep talking then. Uh, yeah, I did. Well, we're following. Yeah, okay, okay. Hey. Difficulties. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So to begin to understand the problem of consurf interaction, we need to understand some of the composition of the lunar soil. The lunar regolith is defined as a top uncompacted layer of the lunar surface. If the size of the particles range from microns to millimeters, with um you have mineral particles and a lunar surface unique particle known as an exludinib, which is a combination of mineral particles bound together by a glassy matrix phase. Uh, the lunar soil is well graded, meaning there is a wide variety in size of particles in uh, even distribution of particle size, as one by this picture, which is a soil sample taken from the Apollo mission. Um, and additionally, the particles are highly angular as a result of a lack of lunar atmosphere and lack of atmospheric atmospheric erosion. A point, yeah. So these particles are already picked up during plume surface interaction or PSI. This is a phenomenon where the plume of a rocket engine, the high velocity, high temperature plume of a rocket engine, impinges upon the lunar surface, causing dust to kick up. Uh, this phenomenon occurs based on previous um, lunar missions. It tends to occur around 40 meters above the lunar surface. However, this also um, increases exponentially as you approach the surface as the impingement area and the veloc veloc exhaust velocity uh, increases. Um, the two main modes of dust kickup are going to be about one to three degrees out from the uh, touchdown site. And that's going to be at a velocity of anywhere up to like two, and two kilometers, two and a half kilometers. And then additional mode of a of directly vertically as a result of a 3D engine module. So this dust kick up causes some pretty significant damage. So notably, there's um projectile weathering, like pitting and weathering as a result of uh, dust impact. This is a plate from the Surveyor 3, which is located about 100 meters away from a lunar touchdown. And then you also have two other modes. You have the um dust contamination where lunar dust sticks to surfaces and whether whether they're sensors or just precision mean machine instruments, this can cause damage and um, bad data. And additionally, the obvious damage to the lunar environment. Matt and Ben are the incidental design objectives for this project. And uh, most of these, well, all of these objectives were outlined in the project guidelines. And so our primary objective was to develop a, uh, uh, dev a system to mitigate the negative impacts of home surface interaction on the human lander and uh, the lunar environment. Um, other key objectives also included that this, this system, that the design must be readily implementable in the coming years. The safety and reliability of the system is also incredibly important and um, is required for mission success. And so this also has to be ensured over repeated landings. The final objective was to determine a budget and bill of materials in order that we required in order to manufacture and assemble our uh, devices. So after careful consideration of all the uh, design objectives, the team brainstormed various ideas. However, we came to a finalized decision that we will be making uh, shock absorbing landing legs in order to uh, combat the challenge. Uh, the shock absorbance system in each leg actually consists of a large damper and spring system, which will attenuate landing forces during uh, uh, when performing a free fall landing maneuver. Um, so how this design basically functions is that first, uh, the primary engine will be shut down at an altitude of 20 meters above the lunar surface, and then the human lander system will actually perform an unpowered uh, controlled descent onto the lunar surface. Um, the design landing legs will actually absorb and dissipate much of the energy uh, of the lander at the moment of touchdown, and this actually will reduce the G-forces uh, that it will accumulate to, to more tolerable levels for astronaut safety. Um, and most importantly, this design uh, mitigates uh, PSI 
by eliminating any high velocity ejecta that arises from uh, engine exhaust impinging on the lunar surface during uh, a traditional unpowered, uh, underpowered descent. Okay, so for this project, we were to choose between two lander systems that were that are so that NASA chose uh, for the Artemis mission. One being the uh, this SpaceX's uh, Starship Book the Human Lander System, and the other being uh, the National Team's Blue Moon Lander. Um, so um, we chose the National Team's Blue Moon Lander for a multitude of reasons. Um, the Blue Moon Lander is, stands at a uh, height of 15, I mean, not <laughs> the Stranger uh, Lander actually stands at a height of 50 meters compared to the Blue Moon Lander 16 meters. And this uh, lower, this shorter um, lander actually allows for a lower center of gravity, thus making the Blue Moon Lander a lot, uh, have a lot more stable lighting configuration. And uh, the Blue Moon Lander also has a lower mass of 40 metric tons compared to the Starship Lander's uh, 1,000 metric tons. And so this uh, uh, smaller, the, this, this weight reduction actually reduces the amount of energy the lander's will be shock absorbing landers will need to uh, dissipate while uh, landings perform. And this will also make it easier for us to implement uh, design and also it will vastly lower our material costs. Okay, so after we decided uh, by the design, we had to figure out how to uh, mount our HLS on, I mean, mount our design onto the HLS. And so we decided that the best way to integrate our system with the HLS would be to um, attach the shock absorbing landing legs onto the HLS via a place pin joint at the top of the landing legs. And um, this this design or this design was chosen because uh, a place pin joint actually allows for um, the restrainment of any translational movement as well as uh, the more controlled rotation. And so it's also important to note that the that this design will attach to existing secondary struts on the HLS. The Apollo uh, lunar excursion modules uh, landing gear system featured uh, crushed cores made out of an aluminum honeycomb to dissipate the energy of landing. It did this by um, through the plastic deformation of the honeycomb structure. This also meant that the damping system was single use only, which was beneficial for the Apollo missions because the descent stage was left on the surface of the moon. Um, this design allowed for a vertical landing speed of about three meters per second and a uh, horizontal speed of about one meters per second. Furthermore, it is also a proven design that has landed uh, humans on the moon. So it served as an inspiration for our design. Uh, the core of our design consists of a, a spring and a screw ball through damper uh, that dissipates energy using friction. Um, they are cased in a cylindrical casing that is uh, that consists, that is made of, that is the leg. Um, so the foot pad attaches to the to the leg using a ball and socket joint, which allows for pre-rotational movement, which makes it easier to run on uneven surfaces. So if the HLS lands on a surface that's not fully even, which is probably not going to be on the moon, the foot pad can adapt and keep the HLS vertical. Uh, a double shear pin design was used to attach the pin joint uh, for the pin joint because um, double shear pin design would better distribute the load uh, of the force upon landing and of the HLS when it's when it's fully settled. And the lower strut translates into the upper casing during compression of the spring. Um, and during compression of the spring is how the energy gets dissipated when it gets transferred to the damper. So to validate our design and develop a good idea of what kind of uh, spring and damping coefficients we would need, we conducted a dynamic simulation using Simulink. Um, we made some assumptions to make sure that we were getting like decent numbers because it was the first time we were using the software and we didn't want to get incorrect results. So we assumed 1D motion and also that there'd be perfect springs and that no energy would be dissipated by the lunar surface and also that the lunar surface was perfectly flat. Um, that left us with two equations of motion, which you can see at the bottom here. Uh, for X is greater than zero, the lander is assumed to be above the lunar surface. And so it's in free fall. The only thing accelerating it is going to be gravitational acceleration. And then for X less than or equal to zero, the lander's feet are going to be in contact with the lunar surface and uh, values of less than zero indicate that the springs and dampers are being compressed. So here we have results for a uh, simulation that we conducted of a an unpowered descent from 20 meters with a mass of 40 metric tons. 
uh, on the left, we have the pot position. On the right, we have the pot of G-force. Um, on the G-force pot, you can see the maximum acceleration that is experienced is only 1.31 Gs, which for the astronauts on board the lander would be less than they experienced during, uh, you know, takeoff. Uh, and then for the position plot, you can see the maximum negative value there is 2.7 meters. That's something we had to consider when we designed our legs. We had to make sure that they could uh, deflect at least 2.7 meters uh, to ensure they wouldn't bottom out on landing. Uh, and then here we have two more plots of force and kinetic energy. Uh, the maximum force that is experienced on that plot you can see is about 512 kilonewtons, while the on the kinetic energy plot we have about 13. Uh, 100 kilojoules of kinetic energy that needs to be dissipated by the legs. Per leg, that came out to be 128 kilonewtons of force and 324 kilojoules of energy. Uh, and these were used in our stress and thermal loading calculations as uh, first estimates. So the material we decided to use to manufacture our spring would be 10 to 3 titanium. Uh, this is because titanium has a high strength to weight ratio. And also this specific blend of titanium has a higher fatigue resistance, which is important because the spring is undergoing uh, cyclic stresses throughout its use. Um, so the parameters used to determine the spring uh, design was first the length of the spring needed. Uh, second, it needed to be able to withstand the force of the entire HLS upon landing and dissipate all the kinetic energy. So the formula we use to get the spring coefficient uh, can be seen up there. So sure mod it's used as a shear sure modulus, inner diameter, outer diameter, and coils of the spring. And as mentioned before, the spring coefficient came out to be 41.3 kilonewtons per meter. Uh, the spring itself is held on the top end of it or one end of it is held in the upper casing and the other end is placed on the on the ball screw nut, and that's how it transmits the energy to the nut. Uh, the material selection for the spring, we looked at three materials and three different parameters. We looked at density, shear modulus, and cost. Density was the most important factor as we wanted to reduce the weight as much as possible. Adding more weight would increase the, the coefficient needed or the spring coefficient needed for the for the lander. And based on this matrix, the most the best material was 10 to 3 titanium, is why we selected it. Uh, for our legs, we needed to decide what kind of damper we wanted to use. So we started looking at the with the crushed cores from the Apollo LEM design. Uh, we ended up having to rule that out because they are not reusable. Uh, then we looked at electromagnetic dampers, which are interesting, and they uh, have an additional advantage of not having any frictional wear between components. So there wouldn't be any damage or there'd be minimal damage over repeated landings. However, we also ruled those out uh, based on our research. We found that the damping coefficients that we could detain with those were not sufficiently high, and also that the magnets that we'd have to use are very sensitive to temperature, which is obviously going to be a challenge in space. Uh, so then we looked at hydraulic and pneumatic dampers, which are really, you know, the standard in industry uh, for damping for dampers. Uh, however, we had to, we, we, if we chose that design, we'd have to worry about boil off leakage and other temperature management concerns. Uh, so we ended up not going with those. We ended up opting for a friction damper, which are simpler to design. And also we felt that we wouldn't have to worry about any sort of uh, electrical power requirements or thermal uh, mitigation. Uh, obviously they do have some concerns with frictional wear and stress loading. Uh, the type of frictional damper that we selected specifically was a ball screw design. This converts linear motion into rotational motion uh, when it's compressed. So the ball screw nut is fixed to the lower section of the strut there, while the screw is mounted to the upper casing using uh, bearings. This allows it to rotate freely. And as the lower strut is fed into the upper casing, the screw will rotate. And there's the, the ball bearings inside the nut, uh, the friction between the, the, ball, the ball bearings in the nut and the screw will provide some damping as well as the inertia of the screw as it rotates. Uh, damping coefficients around 15 kilonewton seconds per meter, which is what we used in our uh, dynamic simulation have been reported with similar ball screw designs. So we do believe it's a feasible uh, design to implement. For our material for these, we opted again for 1023 titanium alloy just because of its high strength properties. And lubricant will be applied to our damper in order to control the level of friction to desired levels. With regard to uh, lubricant selection, we looked at um, dry lubricants instead of liquid lubricants due to the um, requirement that the liquids must have a low enough vapor pressure to withstand the vacuum of space without outgassing, while also being temperature resistant. We looked at molybdenum disulfide polytetrafluoroethylene and an iron plated lead coating. Uh, our objectives were uh, friction and vacuum, temperature range, uh, good, good endurance and good adhesion to the mounting surface. Um, molybdenum disulfide was chosen over the 
other two um, lubricants due to its low vacuum friction coefficient and its large temperature range. Also not mentioned here is uh, that PTFE is a synthetic polymer, so it degrades in high radiation environments such as space. Uh, some of the additional components besides our core of the spring and damper are the upper casing and the foot pad. So the foot pad, we decided to manufacture it from 7075 T621 aluminum alloy. The reason for this is because, um, well, first of all, it's been used in previous missions on the Apollo landing missions. It was also used for the foot pads or aluminum 7075 was so a similar material. Um, also, it's much cheaper than titanium to use. And the requirements for the foot pad in terms of the, uh, the strength it needed was satisfied using aluminum. Um, so we could save some money there. Uh, the foot pad is designed to have a wide surface area. So again, upon landing, if the surface is uneven, the, the ball of socket joint plus the wider surface area would allow the HLS to remain stable on landing. Um, the upper casing is also manufactured from the same material. Uh, again, it doesn't need as high of a strength requirement as the as the damper or the spring. So aluminum is cheaper and provides uh, enough sufficient enough um, force. So uh, the purpose of the upper casing is to provide rigidity and to make sure that to ensure that the spring is providing in a moving in a linear motion and it also protects the spring from any pollutants. And uh, molybdenum disulfide uh, lubricant is also used to reduce friction between the lower strut translating into the upper casing. We also uh, ran a steady state thermal simulation uh, of the leg while it landed on the moon during the lunar daytime. Uh, the um, main source of heat transfer in this situation would be solar radiation uh, and conduction through the surface of the moon. We assumed a worst case scenario for this situation of the lander being landed at the equator, which would lead to high surface temperatures and also receiving the maximum amount of solar radiation on the largest surface area. The maximum temperature we determined was 177 degrees Celsius on the lower strut with a minimum temperature of 21 degrees Celsius on the screw. This is important due to thermal creep uh, occurring above 35% of the melting point. Um, the, and the melting point of titanium is about 1700, 1700 degrees Celsius. So, and, and all the components are below four, about 420 degrees Celsius. So there is no thermal creep present in this situation. We also ran a transient thermal simulation of the damper screw to uh, examine the effects of friction heating. Uh, we modeled the energy dissipated by the landing over the uh, length of the touch-on sequence as a heat flow going to the threaded portion of the screw. Uh, the simulation yielded a delta T of about 92 degrees Celsius on the threads, which was uh, also minimized thermal creep as well. So the next aspect that we looked into was the structural calculations of our design because that determines if it's all feasible. And so the first one we look at is the top pin shear stress. Um, as you can see, the top pin is over here. Um, that little hole has a 100, 100 millimeter diameter along with a slot thickness of roughly 45 millimeters. And so as most of the stress is compressive, it shouldn't yield at, at this joint. However, when we did a stress um, experience on the actual pin that's used, um, we found that the shear in the pin was found to be roughly eight megapascals. And putting that into the stress matrix, we find that the principal stresses are as follows, yielding a von Mises stress of roughly 14 megapascals um, in that pin joint. Uh, we also see that the tensile yield stress of the material is 331 MPAs, as the upper casing does use aluminum. Uh, the next calculations that we did were the lower strut for the normal stresses. Um, as you can see, the, the lower strut includes the ball joint for the foot pad along with the uh, lower casing of the leg. Um, as shown in our Simulink uh, simulations, we had a maximum experience force of roughly 128 kilonewtons on the vertical force was 128 kilonewtons per lander leg. And so with each leg angled at 15 degrees, corrections were made to calculate the force along the actual leg itself. And so from here, we can see that the maximum axial stress contributed to um, the ball joint was roughly eight megapas negative eight megapascals because the minimal area of the ball joint is 141 millimeters. And the lower strut had an inner radius of 75 millimeters and outer radius of 125 millimeters. So it yielded a normal stress value of negative four megapascals. Um, taking a look at the bending in the lower strut, um, we can see that 
the transverse force, maximum transverse force experienced was 33 kilonewtons. Uh, we see that the bending moment can be computed through this equation shown here, where the radius used is the length of the entire lower strut, which is roughly five. And so we found that the bending moment was roughly 168 kilonewton meters, yielding a final uh, stress from bending of plus or minus 126 megapascals when the moment of inertia was included. Looking at the transverse shear stress in this lower strut, um, we can also see that the centroid to neutral axis distance and the first moment of area can be found through these equations on the side here. Um, taking account that the cross-sectional thickness was 50 millimeters, we were able to find that the transverse shear stress computed was three megapascals. Uh, the most important part of this calculation was the buckling aspect of the lower strut because we can't have the actual beam uh, buckling as the lunar or the module lands on the surface of the moon. And so we have to first take into account that the end conditions of the strut include one fixed end, which is the uh, upper casing uh, joint, and one free end, which is the foot pad. And so we can see that the end value is 0.25, which derives a K factor of roughly two. Um, taking account the elastic modulus of the uh, material used, we can find that the critical load is under 71 kilonewtons. Um, experience load of that strut was found earlier and is 124 kilonewtons. And so we can see that buckling isn't present as the load experienced is less than the critical load. Uh, two main components um, in the lower leg principal stresses include the normal stress and bending stress and the results of transverse shear. And so in the yield strength of 1023 titanium, we can see in tension, it's 1,170 megapascals, while in compression, it's 1,145 megapascals. Um, this yields a tension principal stress of 122 megapascals compared to the compression of negative 130 megapascals. Uh, factor safety, which is crucial in our um, design, it was computed to be roughly 23 for the pop pin joint. Uh, we did do calculations and find that the pin diameter could be reduced from 100 to 25 millimeters and will still maintain a factor of safety of 1.5, which is acceptable in aerospace industry. Uh, the constraining factor would be the lower strut buckling, where the factor of safety was found to be 1.38. It is still consistent with aerospace applications of between 1.25 and 1.5. And then finally, the lower leg factor of safety was found to be 9.59 in tension and 8.80 for compression. And it is noted that the higher inertia uh, moment of inertia was required because this was preventing the buckling on the lower leg. And finally, margin of safety is another add-on, um, including the factor of safety. Uh, the margin of safety um, includes the design load limit, which is defined in the forces experienced in previous slides. Uh, desired factor sa of safety that we decided on was 1.25. And so as you see, the top pin had a margin of safety of 14.63, lower strut buckling was 0.11, and then in terms of lower strut, um, it had a margin of safety of 6.68 in tension and 6.04 in compression. And all these values are positive. So that means that our design requirements were met. And especially because the lower strut buckling is 0.11, it's really close to zero. It is the constraining factor as defined earlier also by the factor of safety. So to round out our design, we looked at the inclusion of a LIDAR sensor to our to the lander. Uh, this would be used to do some, sorry, to detect the the, the lunar surface and detect the out and obtain the altitude over the lunar surface for the lander, as well as potentially identifying a suitable landing surface. Since it seems like for our design, it would be most ideal to land on as flat and as smooth of a surface as possible. Uh, this lidar sensor here specifically is the GSFL 4K. It has a maximum range of 100 meters, which is much greater than the 20 meters that is required for a free fall of our uh, lander. Uh, it additionally has a 45 degree FOV and is very lightweight at only three kilograms. So it contribute very minimally to the lander's mass. Uh, it also has lower power, low power requirements, only 30 watts to output data at 25 Hertz. Um, and it also have to be on for the actual landing sequence. Uh, this LIDAR sensor specifically has flight heritage with the OSIRIS-REx mission and uh, LIDAR systems are going to be used for similar ish purposes for the Orion uh, capsule to rendezvous with the the, <laughs> the thing in orbit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we have uh, analyzed the thermal and structural loading of our design. We can begin to look at some of the more 
some of the material and mass costs of implementation. So we have all parts needed for our design here and their effective mass cost per unit and total cost. Uh, the cost per unit is determined from like just stock. It doesn't include manufacturing costs at all. And the off-the-shelf parts, which is these hex bolts and precision pole bearings, are um, parts from online or priced from online manufacturers. Our our um, total mass had came out to be about eight and a half tons, where the total cost came out to be six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So that's our that's our project. Yeah, next slide. That's that's our presentation. Uh, our design is a mass spring damper system that can attenuate the forces of twenty of uh, 20 meters of free fall from on the lunar surface. It utilizes readily implementable technology that has its roots in the Apollo missions and um, it can be manufactured today. Further analysis is needed. So future work, basically. Our analysis here was based on a few assumptions. So we use cantilever beam theory to do our structural analysis. And uh, that's, we use cantilever beam theory on a smooth beam to do our structural and thermal analysis. So to get like a finite element software in and to analyze the threads of the ball screw more closely, that could improve our results. Uh, simulation of soil mechanics. So there's gonna be some soil kick up as a result of the impact of landing on the moon on from 20 meters up. So we gotta analyze how much, uh, kick, where the kick up is, how much is it, how fast is it going and does it cause more damage than the um, rocket plume, plume surface interaction. And then further dynamic and kinematic studies. Uh, our kinematic studies were based on like uniaxial loading with the only damper coming from the damper in our system. There's going to be damping from the moon. The lunar surface is going to be damping as a, a damping and stiffness as a result of the um, HLS body. So modeling a more complete uh, simulation there would be beneficial. So thank you. Any questions? You guys can talk for yourself if you want. <laughs> Round of applause. So, <laughs> um, so I've got a few questions off the back of us. You want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you go to slide 15 real quick? I think it was 15. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so a big a uh, point of advice, whenever you're going to be presenting on something, make sure you're always ready or going to talk about everything you put up on the slide. I know it sounds kind of innocuous, but like it's pretty important because I'm, I didn't see a single explanation about the equation up at the top there. What is that? Exactly. Oh, oh, did you explain yeah. that? Oh, yeah. oh, I'm done. Then. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's on me then. Um, sorry about that. Um, I'm yeah, just about that. Uh, in terms of um, just content in general, I, I guess like um, especially when you get into the later stuff in terms of like the structural analysis, sometimes when it comes to like demonstrating like um, uh, your concept, it's not really very good practice to just list a bunch of numbers. And because I felt myself getting lost in the sauce of what you guys are trying to explain, so it, it's just a little word of advice, just a. a, a, a on a deeper level, especially when you're going to be using something with uh, a large number of um, significant figures. I mean, you guys didn't use too many, but considering you used so many different numbers, I was starting to get lost as to what you guys were exactly explaining. But it all made sense. It's just a matter of like, I, I you got to expect that everyone in your audience is going to be like a layman. <laughs> so you got to assume that to make sure they all know what you're about to talk about. But that's not necessarily always true with every single uh, thing in industry. That's kind of a major thing. But um. Uh, well, I guess the million dollar question is, and I'm, I guess I might, I might either might have missed it or um, I am not really sure. Uh, how exactly does this mitigate the dust? That's just kind of what gives, I didn't really pick that up. So, I mean, with like the thruster and traditional thruster landing, it's going to be ejecting particles out at extremely high speeds. Like we talked about with the Apollo missions, they measured it at over two kilometers a second, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the exhaust gases are coming out at several thousand meters per second. Uh, and I think that we believe with this design, it's just not, it doesn't seem like obviously, like what we mentioned at the conclusion that there'd have to be studies on like soil mechanics and stuff as it as it drops, but it doesn't seem likely that it would eject uh, dust out at, you know, 2000 meters oh, per second. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you're, right. Okay, so you're making the assumption that the cutoff of the engine is going to be before landing. Right, right, yeah. yes. I see. Yeah. Okay, I missed that part. That makes sense. So instead of you're just, yeah, 
Assuming the idea of dropping the whole system. It's pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a lot safe, it's like yeah, this... dropping. It, it is safe because we calculated that the G forces <laughs> experience was going to be like a roughly 1.3 like Earth Gs, which is less than the roughly three or four Gs that astronauts do experience as they lift off. And so because of that, it should be safe. Uh, it, is, it is safe. It is safe. We're also assuming that there is some ADS system in the HLS. Feet up and... So it's going to be a controlled ball. It's it's there's actually... a control system. A I mean, in our in our buckling calculation, we um, in our simulink um, simulation, we found that the total force experienced by the lunar lander, like vertical force, was five hundred and twelve kilonewtons. So distributing that along the four different legs is roughly one hundred and twenty-eight kilonewtons, as I explained in the structural slides. Okay. If you want to, if you want to pan to that. Um, and so in our buckling, like we said, um, the critical load was found for the material and the angle that it was um, located at. Uh, yeah, or it was, it was the buckling more, more. Yeah. And so the critical load was found to be 171 kilonewtons. And because the lunar, uh, the legs experience 124 kilonewtons along the leg itself, it is less than the critical load for buckling of the casing based on the dimensions that we had for its Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of your slides, you uh, mentioned a, a, a list of the factors of safety and somewhere as high as eight or nine. Could you explain that? Yeah, so in our design, since we used uh, 10 to 3 titanium, the yield point of that material is really, really high. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of our um, lower leg, the factor of safety is eight or nine in tension and compression. It's because the material is so stiff and the force experienced by that part of the leg isn't. Well, you don't need to use titanium. No, but the thing is, with the titanium, though, it is important for the buckling, because in other aspects, it's like, it's always a give and take, right? So, sure. in, in terms of the buckling, it, it is required for the titanium, because we see that, even right now, the factor of safety is 1.3, which is satisfactory for aerospace applications, um, and that higher moment of inertia. What? She prefers 1.5. Well, it rounds up. It rounds up to 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um, but but yeah. So it is like I mentioned. It is required for the higher moment of inertia because buckling is. Uh, we feel we felt like buckling was the most important part or important constraint in our design mm -hmm. when comparing the tension, compression, stresses. I got another couple other things here. Um, mm -hmm. Can you change this page 16? I think there's a way to. There's all oh, my notes. It's there already. It's on pages. Okay, well, excellent. So, if the shear module is considered as one criteria to for the material section, it's because in the equation you have G. Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay, okay, I understand. I feel like, what, why are you comparing shear modules? Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, now I understand. Um, probably for the equation here. <laughs> yeah, because because normally people will feel like, what, why why comparing shear modules? I mean, uh, so. Uh, uh, and can you go to the, the, the structure calculation part? Uh, which like the structural so i am just a little surprised your safety factor in the end is fine but when you see the actual stress calculation here it's like really i mean the bonus stress found to be 14 uh 10 year strength allowable uh year strength is 300 how 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 come in the end you have like one point something Safety factor. No, that that's for the lower strut. That was the buckling of the lower strut. This is talking about the upper casing. I think you have many safety factor on that page, and most of them are like uh, below ten. So and that's the, I don't understand. I mean, if it's fourteen, then it's three hundred. How how is no, that one? That one had a uh, twenty three as the factor safety. Because you see, like it, it kind of went oh, in order. Okay, so the top okay. pin is the first factor safety that was mentioned, and so. Okay, 
Uh, next one. So this is purely for compressive stress. There's no talking in the video. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, next one. So now you have uh, 126. What is allowable? For this material, because this is the lower leg, we went with that titanium. I think it was somewhere around, sorry, phone call. Uh, somewhere around 1170 megapascals was the yield stress. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so, so like the lower strut, like all of these calculations are leading up to that buckling calculation. At the so end. basically, you just say that all the calculations are really <laughs> the only critical thing that uh, for your design is only buckle. Essentially, yeah. Well, that, that's what we found out after all, doing conducting all of the calculations okay. was the buckling was the constraining factor. Okay. That is a good question. I think. Okay. Uh, so does that, I guess I'm just kind of thinking in terms of redundancy because like in the case of like, for a, what if a string or a damper failed during landing, like what is the protocol there? It's a great question. Especially <laughs> <laughs> when it's because it's uh, the lander is going to be reused. Right. And, right. Assuming that, you know, NASA doesn't like a fits anytime soon, but, yeah. but, uh, yeah, just a just a thought. Like if a like damper fails, for example, there's a potential that the spring could just like you know bounce it right back up. Like, would you need some other additional system involved, like uh, like a small like RCS thruster or something like that, to make sure that it doesn't turn the wrong way? And especially especially if you're like in like an accidentally landing in a spot with a really, like high angle like like ledge or rock or something like that, like it might be something to also consider as well. That's a thought. Have you guys had any other any ideas on that or something like? Yeah, I mean, we definitely realize it's a uh, like an idea that at first makes you go like, "What? <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna drop the lander?" So, and it definitely would be have, have to be something that you'd have to look into, like integrating more safety protocols with such a uh, maneuver. Sure. <laughs> uh, the question for this page is, uh, how did you get calculate the QX? Or QX personal manager. Oh, honestly, can't remember how I calculated it. <laughs> but I had you for structure. <laughs> 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 yeah, the area 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 area. Area. based off of the centroid position. Well, I mean, what error did you consider when you used the QX? Just, it was just like the. Area not including this whole because this is a like whole area one, like the, the cross section of the pipe. Right. So it's like two semicircles. Right. right, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Next page. You guys are lucky you're not doing any propulsion stuff. Yes. What does ten two three stand for? It's the yeah. It's it's like I can't remember which one is which, but it's like aluminum. Vanadium, uh, I think. Yeah, some. Yeah, there are a bunch of a bunch of. Yeah, it's like 7,000 to 3,000 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 to 3
So, so the things I'm, 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 I'm thinking that actually there are some calculation can be split because if you go back to the uh, shear stress cross tangent shear transfer shear, if you already calculate bending and you see that oh it's 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 it's, it's so much lower than the allowable, the shear stress cross transfer shear can just ignore it because That's you true. know that if it's bending it's okay normal stress cross bending is okay then it, there's no point to calculate shear stress cross right. Right. We just like math so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. And um next one. This is for some. Yeah. Um, next one. Yeah. So so I, I think for the start part, it's pretty, pretty much enough. Um, and and and. Mm, um. Yeah. Um. No, no, I'm on my head. I think you guys did pretty good. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you take a picture of us? Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, Wait, wait, pull up your notes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you. Like, yeah. you say that like justifying like dropping the lander is crazy. You could you see it when my, me and my uh, PI had to uh, uh, justify why we need two nuclear cores in a in a, in a <laughs> propulsion vehicle to NASA. That was that was crazy. That's why we went with the term unpowered controlled SN. <laughs> like, like NASA would appreciate it. Like, drop it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be better than just say like straight drop landers. <laughs> we also talking about avoiding the word impact. 